Now, I know none of my colleagues on the other side of the aisle will admit to being racist, and I don't think they are. But when you look at the rhetoric and you hear the talking points and look at the le legislation that's put forward, what are we to say? Of the five markups, um, any bills on teacher pay that you've marked up? I know because... Uh, the federal government is not involved in that issue. It's not the role of the federal government to be involved with teacher pay. Not, not the role of the federal government to be involved in teacher pay. Okay, good to know. Have you had any markups on student safety, um, school shootings, hardening schools, taking actions to better protect our students in light of uh, we violence? We have not had a markup. No, on, mark no markups on, on that. Uh, any markups on extending learning time for students that are struggling with learning loss following the pandemic? As you've noted, a lot of students uh, ultimately fell behind as a result of the pandemic. I wonder if any bills around... No markup on that. No markups on that. So, and uh, any markups on uh, school meals, issues around school meals, obviously hunger in schools, kind of an issue that uh, you might have heard of. <laughs> I know you're familiar with it. I'm just curious if there's been a markup on yeah. that. No, no, but there will be. We will be working on it. I'm glad to hear that. I, ho I hope that that can be scheduled soon because it's a pressing issue in my district and in Colorado. Look, uh, the reason I ask this question, Madam Chair, and I, I think you've answered it for me, eight months under Republican control of the House, no markups on school safety, no markups on teacher pay, no markups on hunger in schools, no markups on trying to address learning gaps as a result of the pandemic, Apparently, on the note, the notion of teacher pay, uh, according to the chairwoman, completely impermissible for this committee to, to hold a hearing on that. It isn't a matter for the federal government to be concerned with. But telling local school districts back in North Carolina or in Virginia or in Colorado what to do with their buildings, somehow that is a matter of province of federal jurisdiction. But the issue around paying teachers is not? Is that the argument that I guess I'm, you're making today? They want to encourage women to have abortions. And what is an abortion, Mr. Speaker? It's killing babies. I've said it on the floor before. The word abortion sounds so clinical, so clean. But we need to say what it is. It is killing babies up to the point of their birth. The Pregnant Students' Rights Act ensures that colleges and universities provide information about the rights and accommodations a college must directly offer a mother as she navigates pregnancy and being a parent to her child. I have to hand it to the majority. With this bill, the MAGA majority has reached new heights or lows, as you want to define it, that are new and creative. They've named this bill the Pregnant Students' Rights Act and didn't bother to include any rights or resources. Not a single new resource or protection for pregnant students. This bill does nothing to support parent students. It's another vehicle for promoting anti-abortion propaganda and deceiving Americans about their health care options. All of this from the same majority that eliminated funding for childcare on college campuses. Funding that helps students have their children in childcare so they can go to class. Defunded by the majority, zeroed out. They pull that one day and the next day, they want students to believe they care about them Give me a break. I can't help but chuckle at the ridiculous arguments coming from the other side of the aisle because while I'll admit that my Republican colleagues are good at naming bills, they are not good at caring for parents or kids after they're born. This so-called Pregnant Students' Rights Act ironically fails to give pregnant students any new rights. It gives them no meaningful information or support, like campus childcare, family housing, or nutrition support, if they choose to be pregnant or parent while in school. Instead, it provides a biased slate of options that push students to keep their pregnancy and raise a child with no mention of contraception or that seeking an abortion is a viable and valid choice. I'm here in support of H.R. 3941, the Schools Not Shelters Act, authored by Representative Molinaro of New York. This legislation would prohibit the use of the facilities of a public elementary school, a public secondary school, 
or an institution of higher education to shelter or house aliens who have not been admitted into the United States. In short, it sends a full-throated message to the Biden administration, Democrat-run cities, and local leaders across the country that the safety and education of students should not be subject to their pro-illegal immigration whims. Madam Chair, uh, do you believe that this bill should apply to private schools? Well, I don't, I don't know of any um, instance where they're putting, trying to put illegal aliens into private schools. I, we're dealing with taxpayer dollars here. Got it. So just to ask you a question again, I get maybe misunderstood the question. Do you think this should apply to private schools? Let me give you some context. One of your colleagues, uh, Representative Balatakis, I believe, has filed an amendment that would make this bill ultimately apply to private schools uh, that receive federal funding on this legislation. I'm just curious. It's not a trick question. I'm wondering, you're the chairwoman of this committee. Do you support that amendment or do you not support it? My understanding is that amendment was withdrawn. So you won't answer the question as to whether or not you believe private schools should be covered under this legislation? It's not the issue at hand. Okay, well, it's, uh, it's quite ironic, quite ironic indeed. I, I don't, it, 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 it is odd to me that you declined to express an opinion on that. You could simply say, I don't think that it should apply to private schools. You might have a rationale for that, or you could say, I think it should, but an amendment wasn't submitted. But in any event, we'll move on if that, to the extent that that's clearly something you don't want to answer. I think I know the reason why. I'm trying to understand how those two things can both be true. That the education committee should have no role in teacher pay, but should tell every school district in the United States of America what they can and cannot do with their buildings. Is that the committee's position? Right now, we have a crisis at our border, as we're told by everyone. And we have uh, the possibility of illegal aliens being housed in buildings, mostly adults, where very close to where children might be. You could consider that a school safety issue, and we do consider it a school safety issue. So you might want to look at it that way. So yes, we're dealing with school safety. If you have adult males in close proximity, we have no idea who they are, what their backgrounds are. You could consider that a school safety Ms. Fox, uh, you heard the question. That wasn't the question. The question was, is it the committee's position that the federal government has no role to play with respect to teacher pay and has every role to play with respect to telling these school districts and schools what they can and cannot do with their facilities. And it yeah. sounds like the answer is yes. And if the answer is yes, you can say yes. I don't, that, 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 yeah, that we, could be your position. We, we do not have a role to play in teacher pay. That is not our role. We have a role into considering about school safety which is saying we have well, not, I, and this I think, is a school I think the American issue. public would be mighty frustrated were they to realize the ways in which the Republicans in Congress have constricted the committee's jurisdiction so that the Education Committee is no longer a place that can hold hearings and inquiries as to how to help ensure that public school teachers can afford to live in the communities that they call home as ranking member Scott uh, did in the last Congress, holding a markup on that very subject, or enabling the committee to hear about student hunger so that students are actually fed and don't go hungry, or taking steps, by the way, bipartisan steps, to try to protect our schools in light of the growing threat of violence in terms of school shootings. Apparently, all of that is off the table for this education committee. And instead, we get bills like this one. Uh, and I, I just, I think it's deeply disappointing. I suspect the American people will feel the same way. I also find it deeply ironic that the same you know, group of my colleagues, and not all of them, but many of them, who bemoan any role for the federal government in education policy, who disclaim any ability for the Secretary of Education to have a role in secondary schools to now say that there's an exception and that this is it. I, I, did you vote, uh, Madam Chair, there was an amendment, you probably recall this, about a month ago, I think it was a month ago, time has flown by here the last couple of months, um, 
to abolish the Department of Education. I think it was to terminate the Department of Education. Did you vote for that amendment? I'm sorry, I don't remember that amendment. There was an amendment during a bill that you brought before this committee uh, regarding sports uh, in, in Title IX. And the amendment to that bill was brought by a gentleman on this committee, Mr. Massey. He's not here to defend the propriety of his amendment, but there are other colleagues of his who are here uh, who co-sponsored that amendment. I believe 160, 164 Republicans voted for it, and I'm wondering if you were among them. Uh, I don't know, but I would, if the Lord put me in charge, I would get the federal, the federal government out of education in a heartbeat because it's not delineated. This seems like an awfully odd way to do that, Ms. Fox. This, I, Madam Chair, with all respect, I don't, I, that's what I'm saying. I, 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 you did well, vote. I, it's, My understanding I, is you voted for this amendment to terminate the Department of Education. That's consistent with what you just said in terms of, you know, if you, if you had your, um, if, you know, your ability had, to do that, if, you'd again, abolish it. And if absolutely. that's the case, I'm not sure why you keep bringing bills to this committee to give the Department of Education and the Secretary of Education more powers over local schools in North Carolina and every other state in the country. It is an odd way to remove the federal government from education policy, but that's your prerogative as chair, and I'm not going to get in your way. With that, uh, Mr. Chairman, I'll yield back the balance of my time. I'm aghast. I'm just aghast at how this bill is being characterized. It's being called an extreme piece of legislation. We want pregnant students to be supported on their campuses and to know that they can be supported. It is, has nothing to do with criminalizing abortions. It has nothing to do with a nationwide abortion ban. Our colleagues on the other side of the aisle say something about healthy babies. What is better than this? We need pregnant women to have good resources and good health care so they can have healthy babies. But they want what they call comprehensive information to women. We are just a few days from what would have been the anniversary of Roe v. Wade. So it's sadly predictable that we're here debating MAGA Republicans' bill that would stigmatize students who parent while in school or seek abortion care. Pregnant and parenting students deserve comprehensive information about their rights and the resources and support they need to thrive at school. What they don't need is lectures about their choices. They don't need obstacles to accessing abortion and the full spectrum of health care, and they certainly don't need this condescending legislation that's more interested in advancing an anti-abortion agenda than genuinely helping students. The decisions about keeping a pregnancy to term and raising a child are serious, private, and personal. Women denied an abortion are four times more likely to live below the federal poverty line. They're more likely to be evicted, go bankrupt, and have debt. They're more likely to stay in contact with a violent partner and raise the resulting child alone. And their children's financial well-being and development are more likely to suffer too. We shouldn't deprive students of making these informed decisions by withholding their full comprehensive options. This bill does a disservice to pregnant and parenting students. Instead, we should focus on strengthening Title IX protections, expanding support systems for families on campus, like the campus program that has been so successful at UC San Diego, and protecting pregnant students from discrimination. And I just have to say, I've been in college more recently than just about anyone here, and I don't remember a single person being pressured into having an abortion. So I urge my colleagues to reject this bill, and I yield back. One in five undergrads are parents one in five. Has anyone on the other side of the aisle talked to those parents about what they need? If they did, they, need, they would find out those students need, need the same things that parents need that Americans need. That's reproductive freedom. That means access to childcare, access to maternity care, access to contraception, and access to abortion care. Madam Speaker, let's fund childcare, not propaganda. Let's restore the reproductive freedom of every single American. That's how you help students, by empowering them, not playing this cynical game with their lives. I yield back. Madam Speaker, I rise in opposition to the Pregnant Student Rights Act, which fails to expand meaningful support and accommodation for students. As a pregnant 
and parent college student, I have personal experience when it comes to this topic. When I was 19 and in college, I became pregnant with my first daughter and shortly after my son. I know the challenges of navigating the education system while balancing motherhood responsibilities. I know how isolating it could be. I know how critical it is for students to have comprehensive information about choices, options, resources, and accommodations. That is why when I was in the Minnesota State Legislature, I introduced and passed a bill not only requiring institutions to provide pregnant and parent students information about their rights and resources for pre and postnatal care. It created a grant program to fund activities that support enrollment, retention, academic success, and graduation. H.R. 6914 is a do-nothing, empty messaging bill that masquerades to support pregnant and parent students but neglects their actual needs. Based on my own experience as a young mom in college and the available data, I know that pregnant and parent students need strong Title IX protections, access to affordable childcare, early education, and pre-K services, expansion of student parent programs, child-friendly study rooms, and lactation accommodation, assistance with basic needs like food, housing, transportation, supplies to ensure that these students and their families have the support they need to thrive. That is why I plan on introducing a bill. Gentleman's time has expired. Uh, yes, I have 30 more, 30 more seconds. 30 seconds. That's why I plan on introducing a bill that not only requires institutions to provide pregnant and parent students with comprehensive information on all of the options and resources available to them, but also increases the resources and accommodations that are necessary for them to succeed. And I hope that my friends on the other side of the aisle will help support that bill and reject the current bill that we're voting on. Thank you, and I yield back. I would like to speak in opposition uh, to this amendment for several reasons. Uh, number one, uh, since New York City has been mentioned multiple times and since my background is as an educator in New York City schools, I just want to highlight for everyone in the audience and my colleagues across the aisle that New York City is what we consider a Title I district. It's a school system that cannot survive without the Title I funds that come from the federal government. The reason why the federal government had to step in, I believe in 1965, to provide Title I resources to uh, lower income uh, communities is because of redlining that was allowed by the federal government uh, in past legislation, which led to the underfunding, the chronic underfunding of schools simply based on race. If you were black or Latino in a particular community, your schools were underfunded, while schools in white suburban communities that had access to federal funds to buy housing, those schools received additional funding. So now this amendment seeks to double down on prior racist policy by implementing present day racist policies in targeting of Title I school districts. I also want to take exception to the term invasion as we describe uh, what's happening here with immigrants, migrants coming to our country seeking asylum. There's a long history of that word invasion being used to describe migrants, particularly from Latino countries coming into our country by white supremacists in their fear mongering around the arrival of immigrants in our country. So I take incredible exception to that word invasion. We are not being invaded. People are coming here to seek asylum, as is the history of the United States. Much of this anti-immigrant rhetoric and policy is aligned to something called the Great Replacement Theory, which was condemned by this Congress in last Congress, and I am proud to be the author of that resolution. The Great Replacement Theory states that the white race is under attack by blacks, Jews, and immigrants, 
and we must do something about it. And many of the mass shooters in our country have identified the great replacement theory as being the motivating factor to their mass shooting, including the Buffalo mass shooting, mass shooting in upstate New York. So the hateful, divisive rhetoric is in the resolution. The hateful, divisive rhetoric is a part of one of the amendments. The hateful, divisive rhetoric is historical as per redlining. And the anti-immigrant sentiment is directly connected to the great replacement theory. I want to remind the gentleman that you cannot engage in characterizing uh, the other members' positions or, or calling their um, position, or in, engaging in personality characterizations. Thank you, Madam Chair. It's just very frustrating because it seems like the legislation itself engages in personalities when it refers to a group of people that is derogatory. So if the legislation is doing it, and we're using words on the other side of the aisle like invasion, as if it's an army coming to our country, is that not personalities? Thank you, and I yield back.